Hello and welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 555. Yes, people, we've been doing this for something like a decade, possibly more. I think since about 2007. And we've reached 555 episodes. It's a party. Actually, we didn't have anything planned. And it's going to be one of the shortest episodes of all time. But uh, it's August 21st. I said August this time. 2019. I'm your host, Sebastian Peak, for this week. And... I'm joined I'm by Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Brett Van Spruenberg. Brett has the most impressive surname of the group. I got to ask, you know, how, how old were you until you were finally able to pronounce that correctly? You know, there was only once that I had to go look at uh, my name written on the side of the wall. And because uh, I had forgotten how to spell it over the summer. And uh, I think the elementary uh School teacher asked me what I was doing, and I just said I was just making sure that you guys spelled it right. Yeah, but was I had spray forgotten. paint. Were... How, did, how did you? How did the? How was the graffiti made? Um, yeah, yeah, you could spray paint it, but you know, you get to a point where you just kind of make a lot of squiggly lines, and people assume that that's. Oh yeah, that kind of looks like yep. your name. Yep. Yeah. Like or my signature. If, you know, it's not really letters. It's just yep. a, a line. Yeah. And whenever anybody's reading out the names of people in the room or something, and I notice that they stumble, I'm going like, Oh, yep, that's me. So I got that going for me. Uh, by the way, if you are interested in watching us do this live, we do it every week, usually uh, around this time, about 10 p.m. Eastern time, mostly on Wednesday nights. Uh, if we're going to change things around and you want to be informed of that, we have what we affectionately call the spam list, which is just an email list. The, all, the only thing we use this for is to tell you when we're going live. So if you don't get an email on Wednesday, probably aren't going live. Maybe it'll be a Thursday podcast that week. But just to know, sign up. That's the only thing we use it for, unfortunately. I mean, I've, I've tried to convince Jim to use it for all sorts of unsolicited advertising and uh, business ventures of mine, and he absolutely refuses. So, uh, Also, patreon.com slash PCPer. If you would like to contribute to our unhealthy hardware reviewing habits, you can donate or up your existing donation, and we will be compelled to read whatever you put in the name field. Anything you want to say anything and as you can see we definitely need to update the uh image on that page there uh so without further ado we have a uh a few things to talk about this week but we're going to do it very fast this is going to be a very quick podcast beginning with a couple of reviews that uh i put up the first is from be quiet dark rock coolers they have a whole series of these things the dark rock four the Dark Rock Pro 4 are the two that I put together for this review. I'd previously reviewed the Dark Rock Slim. And I have to say, just as an aside here at the beginning, the Dark Rock Slim is really good. Because if you look at Dark Rock Slim versus Dark Rock 4, which is a little bit thicker, but still a single tower air cooler. This is We're talking about big air coolers. If you're not familiar with these, if you're listening to the audio, these are along the lines of something you'd expect to see from like Noctua, and other manufacturers of larger tower style coolers. And basically the, the performance of these is what you would expect from a very large, very efficient cooler. Some of the design features of these that are nice are in addition to their appearance, which is this stealthy all black look that they're known for. They get this by using a ceramic infused uh, paint on all of the fins, on all the heat pipes and everything. And then the bases of these are CNC milled. So they're ultra flat. So that's part of their, their performance comes just from the construction. And then you have very, very low noise fans, almost to the point of being inaudible, unless you're putting your face really close to the cooler on an open test bench like I was. I use a sound pressure meter exactly 12 inches away from the fan to get my results here, which is very unrealistic, but I've been doing it for whatever reason. So long story short, check out the review on the site, but these resulted in very low, very low noise levels, which within the limitations of my little meter, which only goes down to 30 decibels. So the room is always somewhere between like 30.5 or something like that. When I actually measured the, the noise floor, these were just above that at idle rising, I think the highest from memory is something like 33 decibels for the dual fan model. And that was, I'm talking 100% fans. I put both fans at 100% on the Dock Rock 
Pro 4, and it was still only like 32 and a half, 33 decibels. So these are very, very quiet. You will not be able to hear them in a case. Very good cooling performance. Of course, uh, there's been some comments, and I absolutely agree. It would have been nice to compare these to a similar Noctua cooler. I don't have a D15 here. I do have a D14 I could unearth. I have the later version of that with PWM fans, so I could put that back on the test bench and get some numbers. But they were the quietest fans out of the group. They were lumped really close together. They're only about a degree apart. But they were also the best performing out of the group, which isn't that surprising because they were up against some smaller towers. But I don't know. Anybody have any thoughts about these just or large air cooling in general? So is that like an enameled paint? Do you think they do a heat treatment on it? Is it pretty, pretty robust? You can't like scrape it off easily? I've managed to scrape the paint off of the edges of the fins with rough handling before, but overall they hand, they hold up pretty well. It's sprayed on. It's It's got ceramic in it, but I think they just spray paint them. The top panel, which is that nice brushed finish, that's a little bit different. That just looks like a separately manufactured part that gets put on top, but the actual fins and things, they're just spray painted. But the, the other aspect of these, which we talked about back with the Dark Rock Slim, is they put these... Mar like they're upraised little dots all over the fins. So as the air passes across, they're apparently hitting more uh, heat, which is one of the reasons they can use the fan speeds they do. They're, they've put Silent Wings <laughs> fans on these that you'd expect to see in a case. Well, they, they create turbulence because uh, laminar flow is very inefficient in getting heat off of something. Yeah. So you've got only a layer of air that is going past and it heats up quickly and you don't pass as much heat, but with a more turbulent flow of air, you have, uh, you know, I mean, it's just liquid dynamics. It's, it's, it's better cooling. And uh, even though potentially if you have a fast enough fan, it will create more noise, but it seems that these, at these levels, it's a really good trade-off that you create all this extra turbulence, a little bit extra, um, which we call it surface area on the uh, on the fins, but uh, yeah, I think it, it's primarily turbulence is, is going to give you a little bit better than just you know a smooth um, fin that will induce lavender flow. I think you just earned the title of a uh, cooler reviewer for the site. What is <laughs> the term granular flow? Well, it's la laminar. laminar. Yeah, laminar. It's, it's, okay. Laminar. It's not just a good idea; it's the law. Okay. <laughs> Granular oh, flow on your displaying my ignorance. Wrong. It's just physics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, not my strong suit, but uh, very few subjects subjects are. Uh, the pricing on these uh, seventy nine. Oh no, seventy five dollars for the smaller one and eighty nine for the larger, the Dark Rock Pro Four. So they're they're up there. I mean, if you look at the D fifteen, that's also eighty nine ninety nine. I really want to get one of those so I can compare those to all the bigger coolers. Uh, and see kind of how they all stack up because somewhere around that ninety dollars range seems to be kind of the, the the spot for the biggest, most efficient air coolers. I did also very briefly test this on the ninety nine hundred K, and I will say, while doing an admirable job and keeping the the thing to I think mid seventies C under load stock, I went ahead and overclocked mine to five gigahertz all cores. And it was a ridiculous voltage. I think it was 1.395 volts because I just doing like automatic motherboard stuff. And it was hitting the TJ Maxx almost immediately. I mean, it made it through, I think, a five minute little test I had of like 100 percent thermal load without throttling. But it was getting close, like it was hitting 100 degrees and backing off to like 99. So there's possibly some throttling going on. But I'm sorry, this was on your 7700K? No, well, I, I did the main testing on 7700K, much to the chagrin yeah. of people who would like to see something newer than that. Easy, easy there know, with that. But, you know, the 7700K yeah, I know. is so freaking hot. It's like, yeah. it's just a little heat-producing square yeah. that's astonishing. But It's, you know, it's hotter than this microphone. Yeah, it's hotter than the sun, actually. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. You know, sometimes well, I, I feel like to that one T-joint. <laughs> yeah, I gotta I gotta say thanks to Toxinate in the chat because my brain sometimes doesn't work. Fluid dynamics, not liquid dynamics, because air is not a liquid. Well 
You know, you say that. Actually, no. The the fans are fluid. Are they fluid dynamic bearing fans? I think so. These silent. Yeah, but fans that's that's very, the bearings. Not not. No, not it's just you flow. talking. It's just you that lives on top of a mountain. I'm, when it hits I'm just 100% not very smart. Humidity in Toronto. The air Josh, is it's, liquid. It sounded smart. I was convinced. Yeah. Well. All right. The, uh, the, let's the stuff move on I to talked about was correct, but just not my terminology. Sure. Yes. Anyway, moving along. Corsair released a new keyboard. I think it was yesterday, and well, maybe it was Monday. And this is the K57 RGB wireless. It looks like another mechanical keyboard, but it's not mechanical. It's an RGB keyboard. It's wireless. It's actually a triple connectivity keyboard. So it'll do Bluetooth. It will do, it has Bluetooth 4.2. It, ha, it will do 2.4 gigahertz, their ultra low latency slipstream wireless technology connection, which they say is less than a millisecond of latency, which is what I used for my testing. And you saw that earlier this year, uh, Jim took a look at, what was it, the Harpoon RGB wireless mouse that used that. So a reliable 2.4, I like those 2.4 gigahertz connections. As long as you can deal with the, the dongle, which is very small on this and actually is stored in the keyboard conveniently. Um, or just connect it with USB. It comes with a USB cable. You can use it for charging. You connect it to the PC and just use it that way. And in fact, you get more lighting options if you have it plugged in with USB. But besides the fact this has per key RGB lighting, it has their Capellix LEDs, though, so they're more energy efficient, which helps with battery life on this when you're in the wireless mode. This is a full-size keyboard that is using rubber dome uh, rubber domes. This is like a membrane style keyboard. What's so, the like travel those... like on those keys? What's the treble? Yeah, with the travel. How much travel? A oh, travel. No, he that asked what the treble sense. is on the keys. I thought, How I, much I thought he said treble. I'm like, you know, I didn't do an audio recording of key presses, but I would say the <laughs> very significant roll off after about eight. Kilohertz. So it's you oh, wouldn't yeah. say it's bassy then. Mm. It's not got not a lot no, of low. No, end. Actually, a surprising amount of bass. I'd say there's a lot of lower mid range presence and a bit of mm -hmm. upper bass. But so it's not a little a bit a little trouble. bit forward is what you're saying. A little I wouldn't use these as your primary speaker. They're okay for like conference calls at your desk. Good to know. I don't think Corsair really meant this to be a speaker. Right. But uh, but how about know, that key this, travel? How about that key travel is Instead. fairly deep, and I did not measure it, but it, I was surprised at how deep it was. It, oh, think back to. <laughs> Think back to, yes, <laughs> think back to older keyboards on like portable computers or even like your average like AT era keyboard that came with rubber domes. So if it didn't have Alp switches or something, this was the kind of feel. So this was sort of a retro feeling keyboard to me because uh -huh. it was that deeper key travel with a bit of a tactile bump and it wasn't clicky at all. So you'd have to, you have to use it. It's, I've used sort of quasi clicky tactile non uh mechanical keyboards before i think logitech launched one like this a couple years ago and it's different but it's it has the benefit at least of being very quiet uh right off the bat so is this kind of like the microsoft ergonomic 4000 keyboard the same kind of dome press button you, you get that you get that push 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 and then it just collapses you're talking about mm. the bendy one, the keyboard that was sort of like yeah, the natural. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah, use yeah. the natural keyboard, Josh, or no? I do. I love it. It's my favorite. Really? Good yeah, God, man. I think this is a little bit of a softer feel than that. It's it's very quiet. I described it as it's it's a little soft feeling. It's not quite mushy, but I I am a very heavy handed typist. I always bottom everything out. So when I was bottoming these out, first of all, it takes a while to get to the bottom because they have a deep key travel. And it's like three and a half millimeters or something. I'm just guessing. And then when you get to the bottom, because it's a rubber dome, there's a bit of that kind of squishy feeling as you've completely compressed the dome. And then as you release it, it starts to pop back up. It does pop back up fairly quickly. This is definitely something you could game on. And it's being sold, I'm sure, to the gaming market. It's a Corsair RGB keyboard. But it's kind of for both purposes. This would be just as well suited to desktop productivity as it would be to gaming. And but it doesn't quiet. have that, that super positive click clack or the click oh, snack no. at the end. So no. I mean, that's no. Yeah, you get that. You get a little bit of a tactile feel as you're pressing the key down, but then it just mm -hmm. kind of goes soft at the bottom before mm -hmm. it pops back up. That wasn't my preference. I mean, I'm spoiled to mechanical keyboards. I always I try to figure out what my favorite key switch is. And then when you go back to a rubber dome, 
uh, I don't know. It's it's just, it's a different feel. So I I wonder if mechanical users would want to switch to it. But if you're coming from a non-mechanical keyboard and check this out, and it's got a lot of features and you could connect it to anything because it's got Bluetooth and USB connection, wireless. So I, I was just kind of had mixed feelings about it. It's very well constructed, even though it is completely made out of plastic, plastic base, plastic top panel. Uh, fairly stable. I mean, it's stable on the desk, although the flip-out feet don't have any rubber bottoms or anything on them. They're just plastic. So it'll move around a bit more if you have it propped up. It has dedicated media keys. It's got some interesting... There's six keys along the left side of the keyboard, kind of like an old-school keyboard. It looks a little bit like those uh, gateway keyboards with the extra row of keys on the left. And those are programmable. This is fully programmable if you use the IQ software. You can do per key lighting customizations. You can record macros. You can make those function keys on the left side, do whatever you want them to do. And you can change the polling rate. Defaults 1000 Hertz, one millisecond like most, but lighting was fine. I mean, the battery life on this, I never got through the first charge. I mean, this will go 175 hours on a charge if you're not using lighting. And if you are, it ranges, they quoted, I think, 35 to 40 hours wireless, depending on whether you're using 2.4 gigahertz or Bluetooth. And then that will drop way down if you have the lighting turned all the way up. There's mm -hmm. different steps you can set the lighting to. There's a lighting button on the keyboard, too. And in fact, in the manual, I noticed it was kind of interesting. They, they have manual controls for lighting. You can go through the different cycles and things. So you don't absolutely have to use the IQ software if you check out the manual and, and look at what key combination to press to change what lighting mode you're in, but you get a lot more out of it if you do use their software, which doesn't require a login or anything. I just installed it and started tweaking settings. So $99.99 though, what do you guys think? $99.99 for a rubber dome keyboard in the mechanical keyboard era. How does that sit with you? Membranes aren't Ooh. necessarily bad. I mean, you know, mechanical switches are the big thing everybody talks about, but you know, there are people who Still like membrane, and not only that, but you've got the the RGB factor. Then you got wireless, and then you got also you can wire it, so it's pretty flexible. Have you tried spilling a pop on it yet? I have not. They didn't advertise this particular one as being like spill proof. I know they have another one that is. They have a pretty big family of keyboards at this point. So this is just another option. I'm sure having a diverse offering. I mean, look at the pasta sauce section at your grocery store. It's just one brand might have like 40 different things on the shelf. There, there's something for everybody. And, but I, I thought like $99 is a lot. It's me, it's not mechanical. But then I'm like, well, the Capellix LEDs and per key lighting always cost more. It's usually like $20 or $30 more for per key lighting when you're looking at, at premium mechanical keyboards. Keycaps on this one were okay. They weren't like special double shot keycaps or anything. But I wasn't expecting that. And the build quality was pretty good. It wasn't like creaky when you tried to twist it. It was well made. And it has a it includes a wrist rest, which is nice. It's like a rubber coated plastic wrist rest, which felt good. So in all, I wouldn't be surprised if this drops like 10 bucks after a little while on the market. But for me, I would probably look at a hundred dollar mechanical keyboard, even if it wasn't quite as fancy. Yeah, probably. Yeah, Plus but you're not an got, RGB mm, enthusiast. Right. Yeah. yeah. And this this has got Unless, like every connectivity option going on it. So true yeah. and i think that the rgbs are like the, the big upsell on it probably yeah. i mean for for the rgb inclined it is nice to be able to program your own colors and it has all sorts of I, one of the effects is called raindrops i think and it, it looks kind of like it's raining down your keyboard it's interesting i stared at that for a few minutes and while procrastinating about writing the actual review you could use that during your next benchmarking session to just kind of zen out Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, although I'd probably just fall asleep at the computer down here. So e either way, you can benchmark in your sleep by now, right? Yeah. Pretty much. Hey, I mean, the, it's muscle done. memory. I know. I need to start that over again. All right. So, uh, <laughs> with that, let us take a short break to thank this week's podcast sponsor. This week's sponsor is Capterra. Now, if you have a business, you need software. There's almost no business out there these days that doesn't either require or at least benefit from having good software. Now, maybe it's it's basic software. It's just stuff like word processing, emails, customer database management, stuff like that. Maybe it's more specific, stuff for managing medical records, stuff for managing employees in the field. Regardless, how do you find the software you need? Maybe you know 
what you need. Like, you know that there's a particular type of software and you just need to make a choice between brands or, or developers. Maybe you don't even know what's out there for your business. How do you go about finding it? And then once you find something, how do you know it's good? How do you know that it, it meets your needs or that it's, it's quality? Well, that's where Captera comes in. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. It features over 950,000 reviews of real software products from real users and enables you to discover everything you need to make an informed decision on acquiring that software for your business. Search through more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from project management, email marketing, to yoga management software, and then read those real reviews. Get that real valuable feedback, reviews you can trust from people who are actually using the software. No matter what kind of software you, your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. Now, here's how you use it. It's 100% free. Just go to captera.com slash pcper. That's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash pcper. And you can start browsing right away. There's no sign up. There's no credit card. There's no payment. It's 100% free for you to use. Start browsing through the categories. Search for a specific uh, type of software. Either way, you're going to find tons of options with easy to read entries for each software product. And then you can read those real reviews, get that valuable feedback. So if you have any type of business and you're looking for software, either if it's a new business or an existing business, you can find the software you need. You can find new software solutions that'll help improve your business and keep your employees and your customers happy. Join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. That's captera.com slash PC per C A P T E R R A dot com slash PC per start searching, find the software that's going to make your business run better. Captera software selection simplified. And we thank Captera for their support of the PC perspective podcast. All right. Thank you, Jim. And thank you to our sponsor. Let us talk about some of the news this week. Gamescom has been going on and there's been a lot of news at a Gamescom brand new product announcements as if we didn't have enough from CES and Computex, there's also Gamescom for new product announcements. But let's talk about NVIDIA, of course, there. NVIDIA's big push has been real-time ray tracing since the end of last year. And no surprise, we're talking about new games with ray tracing. But possibly the biggest news, and if you look at headlines, the biggest news was bringing real-time ray tracing to Minecraft. What do you guys think about this? Have you seen the pictures? Do you, what do you think? real-time ray tracing brings to the Minecraft experience? Well, when I think sure. Minecraft, Go ahead. I, I definitely think cutting-edge graphics. Like, sure. what else would you play it for? I'm well, detecting a little bit of sarcasm balance. there. Well, yeah, no, I, the you know, I still think it's pretty. I, I like it. I like the effects. I like the water effects. Unfortunately, it's, uh, what, it's, it's only the Windows 10 version that they're going to be doing this on? Yes. I don't. No, yeah, I don't like think uses? they said anything about Linux. Nobody. They don't. They didn't say anything about the Java version. Scott did a, a little follow up post with more info about that. The technical stuff is direct lighting, sky, various light sources, emissive surfaces. They're doing hard and soft shadows, pixel and pix, per pixel emissive lighting, and indirect diffuse illumination, and indirect specular illumination reflections. So there's, I mean, all sorts of different features. It's a fully ray traced game at this point. It's a path traced game, very much along the lines of what we saw with uh, Quake, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, is it ray traced the second you start a new game, or do you actually have to build that before you get it in the game? Like build the uh, RTX card in the game? Well, I mean, hell, people have built hard drives, working memory registers, so. Why not you know, build ray tracing? I don't doubt that, but ray trace yeah. game. they should. They missed it out. They missed out. That they hey, could have hey, gone hey, all the way. It just works. It just works. <laughs> so RTX Scott, on, his, baby, RTX on. Uh, all the RTX on pictures always look amazing, but they're picking very good examples of how much better it can look. Although I will say, the first thing I thought of when I saw this was, a, of course, another low geometric complexity game that looks absolutely phenomenal when it's fully ray traced. It seems like these older games or less complex games look, are the best demos for RTX, where well, yeah, otherwise uh, you're seeing as, more subtle differences. As much as I did sort of make fun of it, it's 
gorgeous. Like, like it is done really sure. well. You can totally see the difference, which is also why a lot of the times when they were first showing off RTX, it was in very simple rooms uh, where they could add layers onto it and like have a huge thing. You contrast that to the new Tom Clancy, the division, I think it was where they literally had to put green boxes highlighting where the RTX yeah. effects were, or you couldn't see it at all. Yeah. So yeah, the older games, they benefit more in, in a big way. Exactly. What do you, what do you think about the possible negatives of not being able to see into the areas that are now, you know, more realistically shaded, but you could, you know, in this, this game in particular, you could say, Hey, you know, I used to be able to see into that corner and I could see, you know, monsters and stuff underground, especially when there's, there's very little light, except for maybe what you're carrying with you, or you've shot down in through, through holes and reflection. You know, there's actually a little bit of a detriment to not being able to see stuff in the edges of the of the screen or where the darkness starts. Maybe it adds ambience, you know, but it does affect that's, gameplay. That's, that's why they added the flare gun to uh, Quake Two. Oh, yeah, but they, there's, that, mm-hmm. there's no flare gun in. A big in, problem. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're, you're gonna you have to build adjust build the gameplay. One. Yeah, it's like yeah. Uh, Doom Three. Remember, I mean, until somebody modded in a flashlight that you could attach to your rifle, it was that's, I got a flashlight. Someone's attacking me. I turn to a rifle, and I, then I have epileptic seizures due to all the you know <laughs> flashing of light. Yeah, yeah, and then whatever they find you laying on the floor and wonder what happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. And wow, Doom Three was pretty scary. <laughs> I loved it. It was awesome. Let's play again. Yeah. Well, it's it's modern. No, I think it's great. I think Quake, Quake Two here. is awesome, and and this is gonna add another layer to people who, you know, maybe have just put this to the side because, you know, it's Minecraft. You can only play it so much, but this, mm-hmm. you know, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice adjustment. It's a nice way to introduce the features. And I'm going to be curious about performance because, you know, yeah, Minecraft running at 320 frames per second is, is yeah. a thing of the past. That's a good, another good example of a great, implementation of rtx because if it's still running at over 100 frames per second even with every single feature enabled and on full then it's still a great experience for most people where 2070 take... i don't know that's and that's the other thing would Same. the the minecraft players are not the ones who are going out and spending 700 dollars on a graphics card either nope they never had to be different type of miner you could play it on a potato you know so. I, I never thought we'd benchmark minecraft but maybe this is the year we benchmark <laughs> minecraft it's the new, the new 3080 Ti plays Minecraft at over 80 frames per second. Yeah, first. come on. I mean, do you think you'd be benchmarking Quick 2 again after 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I haven't yet, so I can't even say that unless you have, Josh. I have. But, okay, excellent. Yeah. Let's talk about, hey, speaking of NVIDIA and performance, they released a new Gamescom driver like a gamescom branded well not really but it's the the new game ready driver is 436.02 and after a brief delay like i guess they had to fix the installer it's up it's live and it might be the biggest driver update in a very long time for nvidia certainly the biggest we've seen this year so far because they're talking about performance they're claiming performance improvements of up to 23 percent in popular games on supercars is it on supercards? Well, that's what they showed in the chart. If you look at software op- optimizations they made for Apex Legends, Battlefield 5, Forza Horizon 4, Strange Brigade, and World War Z, the biggest improvement was to Apex Legends. And then Forza Horizon 4 was next. I mean, the, some of the at the bottom end, they're getting like, you know, four or five percent in like Strange Brigade and a little over five percent in World War Z. And it climbs way up to on a 2080 Super, you were getting about 23% higher performance in Apex Legends at 1080p. And these are NVIDIA's numbers. I've not done my own testing on this. But in addition to the performance improvements, which is always great to see, they've added ultra low latency as an option. You can put it on, off, on, or ultra for the low latency mode right in the 3D settings of the NVIDIA control panel. And this is pretty much directly in answer to Radeon anti-lag. So they kind of fired shots at both AMD and Intel with this driver update. And they, they, they had said before the super launch when they were talking to media, like, you know, we've had this anti-lag feature. It sounds like all AMD is doing is just limiting pre-rendered frames to reduce latency. So, you know, we can do that. You can do that in the software. You've been able to do that for 10 years. So now they just made it a more visible setting that actually 
calls itself low latency mode. And then they've added what I am most excited about, integer scaling. So the little graphic, and you have Speaking to have a touring car. Low, la- low level games look better. I know. I mean, it looks absolutely phenomenal. If you're playing a game with like, like a pixel art title or you're running an emulator or DOS box or something, and you want to go full screen, you're pretty much at the mercy of some really ugly linear interpolation or whatever kind of scaling your monitor has. And if, if you can enable this feature, if you have a compatible card and I believe it's only on touring cards, then you can enable integer scaling and it just looks absolutely phenomenal. So uh, Intel, of course, had come out a while back and talked about how their Gen 11 graphics are going to support integer scaling and nobody else is doing this. So now NVIDIA has beaten them to the punch. Unless you can actually go out and get a Gen 11 graphics chip in something right now, I'm not sure. But in addition to this... LXPS? Yeah, I don't know if those are shipping yet. Those are the The first announced. Mm. Yeah, the 13.2 and 1.1 was the first announced, I think. Mm. There's also NVIDIA image sharpening. So obviously we've seen Radeon image sharpening. That was at E3. When they announced the Navi stuff, they talked about Radeon image sharpening, Radeon anti-lag. Image sharpening, they have a new sharpen freestyle filter. And compared to their existing detail filter, they show like an original and then a sharpened screenshot. It's a a very close-up shot of Metro Exodus. And you know it looks significantly better. It, it looks exactly like the stuff that we were being shown at E3 when by mm-hmm. AMD when they were showing us their uh, sharpening filter. And what is kind of a shot, well, more than kind of a shot at AMD here, quote, or their sharpening filter, quote, also offers broader API support than other solutions. Because I think we were all a little stunned at E3 when they were talking about the new Radeon image sharpening. They were talking about API support. And they're like, yep, DX12, DX9, and the Vulkan API. I'm like, what about DX11? You know, we we had to focus our resources where we could focus them. And like, okay, so not most games then? Because you look at it, almost everything out there will run DX11. And a lot of things that are DX12 had that DX11 mode, and they're still the install base of Windows 7 users, especially internationally. But, you know, DX9 support, so... And Vulcan. But with this, it's DX9, DX11, DX12, and Vulcan. So they've covered it all. And there's currently a list they have, which was a little over 600 games when I published this a couple days ago. More game support being added via future game ready driver releases. So they'll just keep on adding new games to the list. But, um, you know, I don't know how you guys feel about a driver update, but if you're on NVIDIA, I feel like this is a very nice little value add. It's kind of like, it's kind of like detonator 2019. <laughs> you, you, I haven't seen one of those in a long time. For your time. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't get the reference at all. You don't. The okay. So in, in about 2003, NVIDIA launched their detonator driver series, which promised really? all these, you know, performance increase. It actually delivered quite a bit. But yeah, they everything after that was was detonator. Do you detonator. know that there was a detonator movie in two thousand three? It gets uh, wouldn't shock me. It is on Rotten Tomatoes. Apparently, not very well rated here. Yeah, no, yeah, there so you go. 12, detonator 12%. drivers forty five twenty three. I think that was the first one. Wow, good lord, that was forty five. Was that in the FX era or was it pre? Oh, just last week. No, that was pre. That was pre. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, actually, it well, was in, uh, where the actually the first detonator was for GeForce Three when they went to the the GeForce uh, Three Five Hundred, uh, GeForce Three T Five Hundred. God, it's been so damn long. But yeah. yeah, no, it was when they did a refresh of the GeForce Three, um, that had faster clock speeds overall, and then they also introduced these detonator drivers at the same time. So. Exciting we need to do stuff. a retro. Was... We need to do a retro show, Josh. PC per sure. rewind. Fly you to Kalamazoo, and the two of us will just stand here and talk about hardware and make about hundred okay. videos. I can do that. <laughs> okay. The other big thing that just happened, uh, we had been teased with the 
some additional processors coming from Intel as part of their 10th generation mobile family. And then officially they launched today, the press release went out. And in addition to Ice Lake, the 10th generation family now has Comet Lake. And Comet Lake, which I did not catch at first and had to kind of go back. I'm like, oh, okay, this makes sense now. Because of some of the architectural things, like the lack of Gen 11 graphics support, these are 14 nanometer parts. So the 10th generation mobile family is apparently now complete and it's a mix of 10 and 14 nanometer stuff. So I'll get anyone's thoughts on that as we go. But if you look at just the overview, the big deal about this is for currently for higher performance machines on say Coffee Lake, you can go up to, I think a six, no eight cores on certain mobile workstations. And of course they shoved that into the MacBook Pro for some reason, even though it doesn't have adequate cooling for it, but those are 45 watt parts if you're on Coffee Lake H. And now they're bringing up to a six core 12 thread processor to the U series, which is a first for the U series. It previously been limited to quad core. And now we're talking about a 25 watt TDP, which is configurable. So it's one of those 15 or 25 watt configurable TDPs. And they're a very aggressive clock speeds on these. I think that's the advantage of them sticking with 14 nanometer on these. Cause we saw some lower clocks with ice Lake. And this is like up to 4.9 gigahertz on the four core eight thread part. I think it was only 4.7 gigahertz on the top end six core part, but U and Y series being announced here, eight new SKUs, faster memory support, but not as fast as Ice Lake. So if you're looking as a, a home user, an enthusiast on a thin and light or a convertible two-in-one laptop, maybe Ice Lake is still the way to go. But if you're going for something with maybe a dedicated GPU, so you don't need the faster Gen 11 graphics, so you don't need as fast memory, like the, the top memory LPDDR4X is supported with this, but it's only up to 2933, whereas we saw 70 or 3733, I think with Ice Lake. But again, no Gen 11 graphics, just UHD graphics on these. We'll talk about the naming scheme in a minute, but... Well, it deeply guys... worries me that V and C are so close together on the keyboard that I've had to triple check that post a couple of times. V just and to make C. sure. Hmm. You I don't really get don't the want reference. To call it Again. Vomit leg. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, I mean, okay. So, so these are basically the same architecture as Skylake. It's, it's Skylake, but it's matured. It's on Take three. What they're, yeah, they're, they're massage. It's like Skylake nanometer process. <laughs> How many pluses? How many pluses after the process? No, I think it's 14, 14. plus. plus. Well, 14 plus, plus, plus. plus, I, plus. I think it's plus, plus. Double plus. I'm good. not sure. Double plus. Their actual Double plus quote. Good. Their actual quote is the new 10th gen Intel core processors leverage the improvements in intra node optimizations on Intel's highly optimized 14 nanometer process technology that enables up to 16% overall performance gains, et cetera, et cetera. So they don't say anything about the pluses. Us? What? It tells us the 10 nanometer is still kind of hurting. If yeah. You, I, mean, I mean, is it a good trade off? If they could, if they could go with higher clock speeds with these parts hitting these, lower TDPs, if you look at the current offering, 8th gen stuff that's on everything right now, where you have up to 4 cores at 25 watts, or move up to 45 watts, configurable down to 35, for anything with 6 or 8 cores for a mobile workstation. And with this, at least you are bringing down those higher core counts, which they pretty much had to do. They talked about up to, to I think it was double the performance of previous parts, but I think that's probably multi-threaded performance. And they were comparing actually an i7-8565U, which is four cores, eight threads, to a core i7-107010, uh, 10710U, however that's going to be. I, don't, I haven't figured out how to say it yet. 10710. That's the other thing about these. They've Those product numbers that we had seen, I think, leak out before all of this, which were a little bit different when Isolate came out because their example is when they break down, like decode how to read these, the graphic shows Intel Core i7 1065G7 as an Isolate example, where 
the brand modifier is the i7, the gen indicator is the 10, the skew numeric digits are the six, five, although I think the five was actually the U and the O was the Y, I think. And then G7 mm, is the graphics not, level, although it's... Comet Lake I has got a zero on a U. U. Well, no, because they changed it because with Comet Lake, they've brought back the U and the Y at the end because they're not doing the whole G modifier for the Iris Plus graphics level. So now to read a Comet Lake, it's Core i7 10... 710U, which has a product line suffix, which is what they're calling the U now. And then the SKU numeric digits are apparently the 710 with the gen indicator still being a 10. I don't know. I, I, I guess they didn't want to go back in time and use lower numbers. But at this point, do you really want five digits plus a product line suffix after the brand modifier? I mean, people are going to be looking at this in the store like, okay, wait, this one's a 1065 G7, but this one says 1071. Is that an O or a, or a zero? And then what's the U mean? And I don't want to be working in like a Best Buy when somebody's trying to figure out what the difference yeah. between these It's are. like they specially yeah. shipped over Gigabyte's naming guy over to his <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Pretty much. <clears throat> you know, he was a visionary years from now. He's behind before his time, and Intel decided to to bring him into the fold. I look forward well, these to are... three years from now ordering the Core i7 8675309JNY. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I got that <laughs> reference. The first one tonight. Hey, uh, let's talk about architecture. Well, not really, but I'll talk about where to find information about architecture because we're well past our thirty minutes already. Somehow, Whoops. Uh, yeah. Our DNA architecture, you know, uh, if you want to read a breakdown about this, what better way than a white paper and AMD just last night published a white paper on this. I got an email at 928 PM saying, Hey, our DNA white paper has been published. So I got this little news post up and I have links. You can go out and look at their deep dive analysis page. And you can also download the white paper right from AMD. It's a PDF and read all about what makes Navi tick. And RDNA is a very impressive architecture as far as getting work done. It's very efficient at the front end. And maybe you can get some understanding about how it is that seven nanometer can be close to the same wattage that we saw previously, but just so much more efficient because they're just doing so much more work than they were with GCN. It's pretty remarkable. The comparison uh, chart was sort of interesting, the historical, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, where they had the Gen 1 through 5 uh, labeled up there and to see what they were doing before with like matrix math and then looking how they'd broken it down into the different steps and then eventually kind of the stuff that they began to cascade together and um, the efficiencies they started to do. It was sort of an interesting historical look. You know, I, I'd read part of it and I was, yeah, that, that one. I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, we got to look at these slides when we were at E3. So if you're into that sort Which, of thing, you might enjoy this. It's yes. all math, baby. Yeah, if you're not, then, then don't look. Then don't look. Lots if you're not into math. it, then, then look away. Lot math that, I mean, I was I was taking notes, like, you know, I was I was doing everything I could, but it was mostly beyond me. I wish I saw the first one that was like the matrix math one, and I'm like, wow, I used to do that by hand. Seriously. For fun? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> work well he was employed uh, at one time yes oh yeah. now i i don't know what i do anymore <laughs> you can come clean my office i mean <laughs> hey Th that's part of the charm of your office what would it, what would happen <sighs> if those ripper xxl boxes? you know I, you got to see the 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 bathtub with the the Ooh. axle sitting in it in my front yard it's awesome <laughs> how many it's cars like are up on the a blocks? water feature yeah, how many how many cars are up on blocks out there? I mean, got sure a house you know that's the mobile yard. and a car that's not. Yeah, we can go on for hours. No. <laughs> okay, uh, let's not though. Uh, quickly, <laughs> Jeremy, you are scaring the crap out of everybody yet again, of course, because we were we we're all screwed and there's no coming back. No, this is a good scare. Yeah, is it? Was, ask not who has been pwned for it. It is you. <laughs> I. 
it's it's a, a site that a lot of people shockingly do not know about, uh, which is called Have I Been Pwned? And it's essentially, uh, and that was a couple of days ago, so that 8 billion number is probably significantly higher at this point. Uh, but it keeps track of all the various breaches that have happened, and you can put in uh, your email address to find out if it's been involved in a breach. The answer is yes. Uh, though it may not have been anything other than your own bloody uh, just sort of information. Oh, hey. Not yet, wow. Sebastian. You're still young yet. Soon. After this podcast, yes. And it will also let you Thanks, check guys. and see. You're welcome. If your password's common enough that chances are it's on a rainbow table everywhere. And so the reason that was posted was there was a Google study just done and there's hundreds of thousands of people out there who all use the same freaking password for every single account that they have. And it happens to usually be something simple enough that it's already on the dictionary attacks that are constantly going on. And it's just, for Christ's sakes, people, just stop and think for a minute. Even if you don't want to do a, a password manager like LastPass or one of the other ones, because, well, hey, they're not perfect and... It's it's just another thing. Uh, Chrome now has an add-in called the Password Checkup, which essentially just does an automatic search the second that you create it. And it doesn't send it in plain text. It does a hash, and it sends it off to the database to see, yep, okay, that, that one's on the hash table. So don't use it. Well, 1Password, which is one of the other managers, actually has a yep. nice um, utility that integrates with pretty much everything, uh, even uh, Firefox, Safari, Chrome. gives a nice little tool, an autofill, and a generator that's uh, against all the forms. So that's a recommended one. And it shares to other computers that you install it to, as well as uh, like your phone, or they have an Android app and an iPhone app. That works pretty well. Uh, oh, the, and One of the simplest things... Uh, assuming that the people who create the passwords don't block special characters. No, let's limit to you to about a dozen characters in addition to the alphabet. So mm -hmm. we can limit the number of choices that you have to make a secure password is write yourself a stupid little phrase that makes absolutely no sense to anything but yourself with proper punctuation and capitalization. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't care how good your 2080 TI is at chugging away. It's going to take it until the heat death of the universe to get that at this point. Yeah. Length is good entropy. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Any, okay. All right. Just stop. That might not be the best thoughts? password, but it's not bad. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah. That's nice. Uh, uh, we have a couple <laughs> picks of the week that we can cover here. Jeremy, you are first on the list. I found myself seriously considering buying a controller oh, because no. As it turns out, in order to play Fight Crab, you want one because it's not easy to play on a keyboard. Fight Crab is every bit as insanely, brilliantly ridiculous as you would expect. But the thing Those is, lightsabers. Oh, I yeah, the, there's lightsabers. Uh, but the thing mm -hmm. is that each, the two claws are uh, controlled separately. Right, so okay. with two analog sticks, it actually would make sense because you can do stuff like that much easier than you can a key on a keyboard, and it's that friggin' brilliantly stupid uh, as you are looking at right now. Uh, for the <laughs> audio viewers, who have awesome. no idea what I'm talking about. It is literally awesome. animated crabs trying to kill each other with yeah. everything yeah. you can imagine. Uh, occasionally, there's a lobster just because there has to be. I mean, it kind of looks like a, a whacked out version of. Uh, Smash Brothers, but with crabs and yeah. it's like an over the show. You know, it all started with goat simulator view. and now yes, we're at crabs and lobsters. And then all they're attacking each other with really chains wonder. here. Like, I don't know what's happening. Champagne so the idea is you're bottle. completely immortal. You cannot be killed, but if you are flipped over onto your back, that's it. You must submit okay. to the pot and be cooked. Mm. <laughs> and yes, there is a lasting in King Crabs because it's freaking awesome. Place. There has to be. It's wow. early access. Where do you, you get, where do you from, get uh, this itch.io okay. uh, developer? And I think it was like 23 bucks. Mm. It's still an early access or sorry, uh, 20 bucks Canadian, about 14 something American. And it's freaking worth it. Very nice. Josh, you have something a little different. 
It is a little different for those who who like to imbibe in the finer things in life. Uh, I just recently got these uh, Visky Scotch glasses. They're nice. They're heavy. They're durable. They 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 get the smell of the whiskey up into your nose. It's a better experience than just like a big tumbler. So uh, yeah, they're they're not exactly cheap, but they're well built and they look nice and, what, and they what's work not exactly cheap? Advertised. how much do these run 22 bucks for, for a pair two, or a pair right okay yeah. is it the german pronunciation of whiskey or, or is this actually i have no idea but this called yeah, whiskey no they, they have multiple type of glassware for mm. different drinks so or yeah, no. you know what v have ways of making you talk yes yeah, so or mm-hmm I'm the window viper. I've come to vipe your windows. <laughs> your windows? Yes. Your windows. Yeah, so it's a little cheaper than a Glen Cairn glass, which is kind of nice. Yeah. So anyway, Excellent. it's a nice little thing if if you if you enjoy your whiskey. Brett, you are next. It's oh, a double I see shot. The, I see what's going on here. It's a double shot of celebration today. Uh, one is a uh, life size uh, five 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 timer in honor of today's podcast five five five. For those people who don't know what a five 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 is, is is it's a timing chip. That sounds stupid until you realize that there are literally you know hundreds of things that you probably interact with every day that has one of these in it from your microwave to your car. And you know, maybe not as a discrete chip, but as this circuit is extremely popular and is used a lot uh, uh, everywhere for many, many different things. So this is a life-size variant, and I, I joke, it's actually, it's huge. I think there's a picture of somebody holding it in their hand as one of those, I guess the second one, there you go. It's it's gigantic, so it's fun. Uh, you get to you get to put it together and assemble it, and it's a, a real um, you know, look at what an integrated circuit actually does. And then when you, when you assemble it and put it together, it's actually functional, and you can build mm -hmm. something that's actually practical which I linked to next, and that's a PWM fan controller. Oh my God, yes. Build your own PWM controller, what everybody always wants on their desk. Test your fans. Run your fans from the outside. Use it, it to cool the giant 555 chip you built. It's whatever. Yep, it's, that's like self-fulfilling. That's like, like recursive. That's recursive yes. logic. 555, celebrate. Go build it. Self-fulfilling, is that like... Um... It's not Are like there self Chlorians involved. Oh no, <laughs> it's not the chosen one. More than one person can be involved. I don't have a pick. Have I have a... an anti pick this week. Uh, it's an alternative to the Yamaha AGO six six channel USB mixer, which has been problematic for me. It's my second Yamaha. I love Yamaha. You make great stuff, Yamaha. I love your amplifiers. They're a great bang for the buck. But this mixer, man. You have mixed. Rooms? I have nothing. I have mixed. Yes. Ah. All right, I need you to write for me, Jeremy. I mean, you do. I do. I mean, I need you to write on a material. daily basis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have mixed feelings about it. Damn it. Another missed opportunity. All right. Well, thank Man. you for listening or watching. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel and see us do this, because we, you know, unfortunately put this video up for other people to see. Uh, yeah. See how the sausage is made. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, there yeah. is a secret, though. There is at one, at a certain point in the future, these uncut, raw, if you will, versions will be accessible to those in the know. Interesting. That's all I'm going to say for now. That's a little scary. It's like a teaser. <laughs> all right. Mm -hmm. uh, Are you we'll talk starting to you like a digital? No. Um, what do you even call it? Uh, time capsule? You're surreptitiously recording us in our most. Uh, no more so than you're already. I'm being going recorded. to start covering like everywhere you go. Start covering this you know, camera and making yeah, sure this. He's PC pretty is blatant off. about it. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, we'll talk to you guys next week.